This episode is brought to you in part by... Hello and welcome to the People Chronicles Storied Women. I'm Anna Rosie Gara Milch and I'm also the author of Lunch with Lucille. Lunch with Lucille is a story of how one woman's life impacted another woman. And so what we do is we bring women from our community to share their stories so that we can learn from them as well. And today my guest is Yolanda Williams. Welcome Yolanda. Thank you. So the first question we ask all the women who come to um, Storied Women is, what is it that you want us to remember from our chat today? What's the takeaway? The takeaway for me is all things are made new through Christ. So when you talk about this new, all things are made new, uh, what's the old? Can you well, take us to the sure, old? Sure, I could take you to the old. Um, in the old, I was an addict, um, suffered from mental illness. And so the new is I live my new life in Christ. And he's been able to make all things new. So, you know, is it new or renewed? It's new. It's new, brand new? It's brand new. Yeah. So take us back a little bit of, to this life that you once lived. So in my past life, I was an addict. I um, was an alcoholic and an addict, and I was diagnosed schizophrenic. And so how, when you say, how long ago are we talking? We're talking eight years. Just eight years ago? Yes. So how long were you in the throes of addiction? Uh, all my life. So at 51, I straightened up. And you started your addiction at what age? Um, 26. Wow. So, th yeah, 30 years of your life, you were in the throes of addiction? Almost, yes, almost in the years. throes of darkness and domestic violence, abuse, um, molested by my dad. So you've had one after another? Yes. And during that whole time, um, I, I don't know even the question to ask in the sense of during that whole time, when we, where was the hope? There was none. I thought there was no hope. It was just who I was. And um, I always considered myself a victim and that, that's all I had. I was unworthy, undeserving, shamed all the time. So um, it wasn't until October 17, 2011, where I encountered death in the city of Reading. Tell me a little bit about that. So I was out getting high um, with a friend, and we, were, we went to a place, and um, someone, wow, someone from my past came back at me, and um, I really, and so he brutally beat me. She left me there. And when I got to the hospital and I seen the pain in my daughter's face. So all through this you have children as well? Yes. Wow. So when I seen the pain in my, child, my two daughters' face who showed up at the hospital, I promised myself I would never hurt my children again. So, you know, I was drunk. I was on crack cocaine came out in my system and, and you know, I was in the trauma and the doctor said, well, um, we are sending you to the psych unit. And I said, oh no, you're not. I'm, I don't have a mental issue. I'm an addict. And that was the first time in my life that I admitted. That you ever said those words? Yes. Wow. And you're 50? I'm 59. So you were 51 years old when that happened? Yes. That you said that you were an addict. What did you think you were doing before that? I just thought I had life under control because I worked, I was a functioning addict. But as an, in addiction, you don't, you don't really think for yourself. It's the drug and the alcohol that controls you. You have no control over your life. Yeah, yeah. And so, so when you said that you saw the pain in your children's eyes, mm -hmm. had you never ever seen pain in their eyes before? I was always too drunk to realize there was pain. Hmm. You become so self-centered. It's about you. It's not about your family. You hurt so many people. Um, but by the grace of God, um, God has restored us. So when you saw their pain, I, you say you think that it's your faith that made you see, finally made you see. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I saw their pain and 
I made the decision that day that I would never live like that again, nor would I ever hurt my children again. So what did you do? So um, we said they wanted to send me to the psych unit, and I said no. So I was, my face was cut, my arm was broken, my ribs were fractured, and my face was like, <laughs> so. Not, my, that, not that pretty little face. No. <laughs> so my niece took me home, and for three days I called the Reading Rehab. and You stayed straight these three days? I stayed sleeping. You stayed sleeping? For three days, yes. It was like I didn't want to face the world. And they finally um, had a bed October 24th. They finally had a bed for me, and I went in, and when I got there, I was so angry. And um, at who? At everything. I was I was angry at the world. I was angry um, at my past. I was angry at the abuse. And so one of the texts, one of the counselors there, finally took the time to read my chart, and she realized that um, it wasn't a drug deal gone bad. That it was an, a husband that came back to kill me. So and their their judgmental, their judgments that they were making about you. Yes, and so she asked me, "How could we help you?" And I, my response to her was, "How can you, if the police say that I'm the type of woman that get taken out in a body bag?" I said, "And it's easier to stay high and drunk than to be in fear." And I told her, "I said, do you know what it is to go home with a six pack of beer?" and your drugs and just stare at the door waiting for him to come in and get you. Yeah. And so. The sense of fear. Yeah. And, I, and that was the first time I realized that what I was running, that I was running from fear. Yeah. You know, and that there was a lot of things inside of me. And so she convinced me to go to a long-term rehab. And um, So when you say long-term rehab, well, that was a 28-day detox. Okay, 28 days. So I went in the 24th of October, and in November, I was taken to Colon November 14th. I was transferred to Colonial House in York, Pennsylvania, where my journey began. And when I was in the rehab, um, the people that were there, so at 51 years old, I thought that going to a rehab was like going to a hospital where you just, okay, you go home and you're better. But God used so many people to show me that was not the case. They would come to me and they would say, so what's your story? And I would say, I don't know, what's yours? And they would say, well, this is my 10th time trying this. And I realized that unless God interceded in my life, that was gonna be me too. And so I started crying out and I said, Lord, if you do not intercede in my life, I am gonna die because I'm gonna go right back out to do drugs. And um, so I just kept crying that and you know, people would come every day and then there was this one young man and he came to me and he said, you know, this is my 20th time coming through rehab. Wow. And I go back out and do the same thing. And that day I got sick and was sent upstairs to the room. And it was very degrading because I vomited on myself and they humiliated me and told me that they didn't bring me into the rehab I brought myself because of my addiction. You know, it's supposed to be tough love. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I went upstairs to the room, I cried out to God and I said, I can't be them. I can't hurt my children anymore. I just can't be them. And so I laid down in the bed and I just started crying out and said, you need to come into my life and heal me, Jesus. I can't do this on my own. And I remember it was 6 o'clock, and I was laying in the bed, and all of a sudden I just felt like they were rocking me back and forth. And I was in a fetal position, and when I woke up, it was 8 o'clock. My fever was gone, but there was something different. 
I woke up and there was something completely different. And I remember going downstairs back to the group meeting and sitting there through the whole meeting, but only thinking that all I wanted was to find the Bible because I needed to know everything the Bible said about being drunk. And so when the meeting was over, I went to find a Bible and I came across the scripture. You are a new creation in Christ. The old man has passed and your new life has begun. And as I read that, it was almost like I felt in the spirit that the Lord said, I'm not going to recover you and I'm not going to rehabilitate you and I'm not going to reeducate you. I'm making all things new. And is this, so tell us now what you do. So now, I am a pastor in the city of Reading. Everybody knows me by Pastor Yoli. Um, I have a ministry called Ashes to Beauty where I go out into the trenches and I minister to the women in the city and some men that, um, and I teach them their identity. And in Christ, all things are made new. And some of them get it, and some of them don't, and, but I still love them. I share the love of Jesus, and I share with them that in Christ, all things are made new. And when we put our hope in Him, and we hold on to the true Word of God, because it's only the Word of God that could transform us. See, with men, our behaviors are modified. I went through that all my life, you know, being diagnosed as schizophrenic, trying to commit suicide seven times. Um, I went through mental illness and I took all the medications that they were on the market to take. Um, but it was when Christ finally laid hold of my heart and my life and started making things new in me that I no longer need them things. My only hope is in Christ. And that's what I teach. I teach them that our only hope is in Him and that when we seek Him and His righteousness, He will add everything onto our lives. And so my greatest thing is I teach people how to apply the Word of God to their lives. Well, you have truly applied the Word of God to your life. I, it's, it's really evident, Yoli, and I just so appreciate your coming into sharing us and, and to teaching us that, you know, wherever we are, we can always be better. Yes. You know, yes. Our, our faith can take us there or whatever takes us this there, but we can be better. Yes, we, we can. can. Be better. Yeah. We can. And I appreciate you coming and sharing that beautiful story with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yoli. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Can we sit down?